Hello, we're now going to look at making or calculating a confidence interval for estimating a population mean. So to start off, anytime you build a confidence interval, you need a point estimate. Well, I have news for you. The sample mean, x bar, is the best point estimate for the population mean mu, believe it or not. Next. We had to introduce a new type of distribution, but don't worry, it's still very similar to the normal distribution. The student's t distribution is a continuous distribution with the following characteristics. It has symmetry with respect to the mean. <clears throat> it's more spread out and flatter than the normal distribution. And as the sample size n gets larger, the t distribution does approach the standard normal distribution. And then we use something called degrees of freedom to determine the type of t distribution and the degrees of freedom is sample size minus one. You don't really need to worry about what degrees of freedom are, you just need to know that that's an element that's used or a component that's used when doing calculations with the t distribution. So when do we use the t distribution? Well we use it when the population standard deviation is not known but the data appear to be bell shaped. That's when we use the t distribution. So for predicting a population mean, the error bound or margin of error formula, when sigma is not known, when the population standard deviation is not known, which obviously if we're estimating a population mean, it's likely we don't know anything about the population standard deviation. Well, the formula is the error is the critical value, t sub alpha over 2, Instead of using the standard normal distribution, we, t we do the t distribution. And then it's the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. You might recognize this standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size. It's called the standard error. It's from the central limit theorem. It's that adjusted standard deviation. So once again, t sub alpha over 2 is called the critical value. Alpha over 2 and the degrees of freedom are used to find that critical value. So here's some notation that you'll see coming up. Mu, remember mu, mu is the population mean, x bar is the sample mean, s is the sample standard deviation, n is the number of sample values or the sample size, big E is the margin of error or the error bound, and t sub alpha over 2 is that critical t value separating an area of alpha over 2 in the right tail of the t distribution. So here's a comparison of the t distribution with the standard normal distribution. So degrees of freedom, which remember that sample size minus one, you look at the shape of the t distribution, it's kind of shallow, it doesn't have a really tall peak on it. But if you up the degrees of freedom to nine, that means the sample size of 10, notice the peak gets taller and your tails get less and less. And then whenever you have your degrees of freedom of infinity, meaning your sample size is extremely large, notice you have your peak and then your tails are very, very, very tiny over here, which is what happens in the standard normal distribution. So that's showing you that the t distribution approaches the standard normal distribution as sample size increases to a very large number. So I'm first going to show you how to use a t table to calculate the critical value for a t distribution. What you'll have to do is you'll have to calculate alpha over 2, that's the area in one tail, and then you'll locate the corresponding column. So you'll find, okay, area in one tail is 0.05. Then you'll identify the degrees of freedom, n minus 1, and then you'll find that along the appropriate row. And then the critical value is the intersection of this row and column. <clears throat> I'll also show you how to use Google Sheets using the Compute tab to calculate that critical value. Although honestly, since we don't really do much with the t-distribution and doing a bunch of hand calculations, you might like the table method better. I don't know. I'll show you both though. <clears throat> calculate the critical value for each of the following. So the confidence level is 95% and the sample size is 9. <clears throat> so that would mean alpha is 1 minus the confidence level, which is 0 0.05, <clears throat> which would mean 
alpha over 2, the area in one of the tails is 0 0.05 over 2. And then degrees of freedom. sometimes abbreviated as df is n minus 1 9 minus 1 which is 8 all right so my area in one tail is 0 0.025 and my degrees of freedom is 8 my area in one tail is 0 0.025 and my degrees of freedom is 8 so where do these this row and this column intersect right at 2.31. So my critical value is 2.31. <clears throat> what if I use Google Sheets? All right, so my degrees of freedom is still going to be 8. And then my area to the left of the data value I'm trying to find will be 1 minus alpha over 2. That's 1 minus 0 0.05 over 2. That's 0.975. That's what we, you would type into Google Sheets. In the Compute tab, there's a region called the T region, and you're going to focus your attention there. <clears throat> so where that 1 minus alpha over 2 comes from is basically from the fact that 95% is the dead center of your bell curve and each of your tails would have to have 2.5% and then that critical T value cuts off your right tail. <clears throat> so area to the left is 97.5% or 0.975. So let's go to our Google Sheet spreadsheet to the compute tab. I'll zoom in a little bit here. All right, all you have to do is type in degrees of freedom of eight, type in area to the left of 0.975, which I already had there for you. So remember, this is the T distribution region and you get about 2.31. So same answer, same answer, 2.31. <clears throat> Let's try this again. Confidence level is 90% and n equals 10. So let's calculate the degrees of freedom first this time. n minus 1, 10 minus 1 is 9. <clears throat> All right, and then we have to find our alpha over 2. Well, alpha is always 1 minus the confidence level, which means alpha over 2, the area in one tail area in one tail is 0 0.05. <clears throat> All right, so area in one tail is 0 0.05, degrees of freedom is 9. Where do where does the row and the column intersect? It looks like 1.83. So the critical value is 1.83. If you were to use Google Sheets again, I won't walk you through the whole process, but I'll tell you what the input is. Degrees of freedom is still 9, and then area to the left will be 1 minus whatever alpha is divided by 2. That's 1 minus 0 0.05. Area to the left would then be 0.95. You can try it out if you want to. 0.95 is your answer, though. Sorry, 0.95 is the area to the left. It'll give you a critical value once again of 1.83 guaranteed or your money back. <clears throat> All right, so to build a confidence interval for the estimate of mu, the population mean, when the standard deviation is population standard deviation is not known, you literally take that point estimate x bar, you subtract the error, you take the point estimate x bar, and you add the error and mu will be somewhere between there with the designated confidence level. And then you also have plus or minus form, and then you have 
interval form as well. It's just like we did for a population proportion, except instead of p hat, we're dealing with x bar, and the formula for the error is slightly different. All right, so the procedure for constructing a confidence interval. Verify the requirements are met. That means the population is normally distributed, or if that's not the case, you really need to have a sample size greater than 30. Using n minus 1 degrees of freedom, you'll find the critical value corresponding to the desired confidence level. You'll evaluate the margin of error. You'll calculate the lower bound and upper bound of your confidence interval, and you will round accordingly. We're going to use technology to do all of this for us for this, this portion. All right, so we will use Google Sheets to calculate the whole confidence interval. We will be using the data list tab. And instead of typing in three pieces of information like we did for the population proportion, we're actually going to have to type in four pieces of information. Sample mean, sample standard deviation, sample size, and confidence level. So hopefully it's not too painful typing in that extra number. <clears throat> so a common claim is that garlic lowers cholesterol levels. In a test of the effectiveness of garlic, 49 subjects were treated with doses of raw garlic and their cholesterol levels were measured before and after the treatment. The changes in their levels of LDL cholesterol have a mean of 0.4 and a standard deviation of 21. Use the sample statistics of n equals 49, x bar equals 0.4, and s equals 21 to construct a 95% confidence interval estimate of the mean net change in LDL cholesterol after the garlic treatment. What does the interval suggest about the effectiveness of garlic in reducing LDL cholesterol? <clears throat> so I have cool good, good news for you here. See these sample statistics? These sample statistics are literally, literally what you are going to type into Google Sheets. All right, in Google Sheets, we'll type Sheets here for Google Sheets. You are going to go to the Data List tab. We're spending a lot of time in the Data List tab. And the region you're going to go to is the one variable confidence interval p-value region. And that's for t-distribution. All right, you need to input the following information. X bar is 0 0.4, and then S is 21, N is 49, and then your confidence level is 0.95, or you could type in 95 with the percent sign, whatever you want to do. So let's check it out. Let's see what happens. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to go to the data list tab, and we have this region, the one variable confidence interval p-value for t-distribution. There's one for z-distribution that we'll talk about momentarily, but x-bar in this case is 0 0.4. Your standard deviation is 21. Your sample size is going to be 49, and confidence level is the only other thing you need and it's going to give you your upper bound and lower bound of your confidence interval, negative 5.63 and 6.43. Negative <clears throat> 5.63, and then you have 6.43. So remember, we're trying to find the... <clears throat> the estimate of the true mean net change in LDL cholesterol after the garlic treatment. So the interpretation of this confidence interval is as follows. With 95% confidence, the mean net change of LDL cholesterol after garlic treatment is between negative 5.63 <coughs> and 6.43. We have to have that sentence statement to go with the confidence interval. So what can we conclude about the effectiveness of garlic in reducing LDL cholesterol? So this interval is cap capturing the change in LDL cholesterol levels. Well, guess what? Since zero is in the interval, what does it mean when the difference between something between two things is zero? Well, it means there is no difference. So since zero is, since zero is in the interval, Garlic likely does not reduce 
LDL cholesterol. Since zero is in the interval, that means there's likely no difference, so garlic likely does not reduce LDL cholesterol. So sad. <clears throat> so now we're also going to look at finding a sample size <clears throat> for estimating a population mean. <clears throat> to find the cor corresponding sample size for various requirements, you must take your critical value, multiply it by the <clears throat> population standard deviation, divide by the margin of error, and then you will square the result. And you may say to yourself, wait a minute, why in the world we don't know the population standard deviation? Well, when we're predicting sample size, we like to use an approximation for that population standard deviation. Otherwise, our life could turn into a living nightmare if it's not already that way. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about this formula. Your value for n that you find has to be rounded up always. <clears throat> and then if you don't know a value for sigma for the population standard deviation, which often happens, you use sigma is equal to the range divided by 4. <clears throat> the range is the maximum value minus the minimum value. <clears throat> so assume we want to estimate the mean IQ score for the population of statistics students. How many statistics students must be randomly selected for IQ test if we want 95% confidence that the sample mean is within 3 IQ points? Here's our error. And then we know that scores range from 60 to 120. We know that for a 95% confidence level, the critical value is 1.96. So the error they wanted is within three points. And then the range, or sorry, the standard deviation is the range divided by four. We're using the estimation rule here. 120 divided by 60 over four. <coughs> 60 over four is 15. And you will plug these into the formula. <clears throat> so I have 1.96 times 15 divided by 3 and this is all squared of course. So that's actually going to give you 29.4 over 3 squared which will give you 9.8 squared we just keep going and going and going, and we actually get 96.04. You're like, can I just get away with messing with or picking 96 people? And with that, I say no. Regardless, you have to round up. Always round up. So we have to use a sample size of 97 in this case. All right, the last thing we're going to do is learn how to create or calculate a confidence interval for estimating a population mean where the population standard deviation is known. We're still going to have our point estimate. We're still going to have our error. But our error, we can actually find a z-score rather than using the t-distribution. So we're allowed to use standard normal just like we normally would. No more t-distribution. That's because the population standard deviation is known. <coughs> Google Sheets. We'll use the same type of stuff, same area, except we'll go to the Z distribution area of the data list tab. So let's do our example. People have died in boat and aircraft accidents due to an inaccurate estimate of the mean weight of men. Over the past several years, the mean weight of men has increased, so we need to update our estimate of that mean so boats, aircrafts, elevators, and other such devices do not become dangerously overloaded. Using the weights of men from a random sample, we obtain these sample statistics. N is 40 x bar is 172.55 and we know from other sources that the population of weights of men has a standard deviation of 26 pounds. So there's that population standard deviation that we know from a previous study potentially. So find the best point estimate of the mean weight of the population of all men. Well that's literally 172.55. Construct a 95% confidence interval. I think we'll use Google Sheets here. Don't mind if I do. So you'll type in X bar, you'll type in a standard deviation. You'll also type in N, which is 40, and you'll type in the confidence level, which is 
So on the data list tab, if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see the Z distribution area. You'll type in X bar, you'll type in your sigma, you'll type in your sample size, and then your confidence level, and you'll have your interval of 164.49 and 180.61. <clears throat> so your confidence interval is going to be 164.49, comma, 180.61. The interpretation is as follows. With 95% confidence, the mean weight of men is between 164.49 pounds and 180.61 pounds. So what do the results suggest about the mean weight of 166.3 pounds that was used to determine the safe passenger capacity of water vessels way back in 1960? Is 166.3 a safe weight to assume or a safe average weight to assume for men, where does 166.3 lie in this confidence interval? <clears throat> well, I would say since 166.3 is almost out of the interval, in particular, it's out of, on the lower end of the interval. Since 166.3 is almost out of the interval, using this weight, may not be safe. They may need to pick a higher weight. However, the point estimate is also 172.55 suggesting a true mean weight higher than 166.3 I mean it's only one sample that we looked at here but if you looked at a variety of samples and you notice that all of them have means above 166.3 well, I think it's kind of likely that you would probably need to increase this average weight that you use to, for safety guidelines because we don't want unsafe vessels. And just real briefly, remember that if sigma is known when you're estimating a population mean, you use the standard normal distribution. And then when sigma is not known <clears throat> and your population is normally distributed, meaning you know it's bell-shaped or... The other requirement is if the sample size is greater than 30, you can actually, you would use the T distribution. But anyway, that's all I have for now. Thanks for watching.